A reading from the Gospel of St. John, the 21st chapter. John writes, after these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. And he showed himself in this way, gathered there together were Simon Peter and Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, the two other of the disciples. And Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to them, well, we'll go with you. So they went out and they got in the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples didn't know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to them, children, you have no fish, have you? They answered, no. And he said to them, cast the net to the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it. Now they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. The disciple that Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. But when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes, for he was naked and jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, only about a hundred yards off. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you've just caught. So Simon Peter went abroad and hauled the net ashore, full of large fish, 153 of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. And Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. And when they finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he said to them, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. And a second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, tend my sheep. And then he said the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you'll stretch forth your hands and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which he would glorify God. And after this, he said to them, follow me. And this is the gospel of the Lord. The floating church. Grace, peace, and mercy from God, the Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We are still in this 50 days of celebrating the resurrection of our Lord. And looking at the stories that were recorded that will give us faith and hope. And so uh, within that, we're looking at the idea of leadership and how the Bible is probably the greatest leadership book ever, ever written and how it can help shape our lives. For we are called to be leaders, leaders in our community, leaders in our family, perhaps leaders at work, certainly leaders in our church, and overall called to lead people to Christ. And so we're given some clues as to how to do that. Well, Stephen Jobs says, people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. And Tom Peters says, leaders don't create followers, they create more leaders. And our job is how to be number one at being number two, because we want Jesus to be number one in our lives. So how do we get good at being number two and putting Jesus first in our lives so we can follow him? Let's take a look at We said that Warren Bennis, the billionaire, says, I used to think that running an organization was equivalent to conducting a symphony orchestra, but I don't think it's quite that. It's more like jazz. There's more 
improvisation. There's more thinking on your feet on the spot. And leadership, well, like I said earlier, if you go on Google, there's over 930 million hits on Google, which means leadership is an overwhelming topic, and it would be almost impossible to cover it. But I want to make it easy, very, very easy, in fact, and break it down for us so we can really appreciate what's behind it and why it is so popular and why it's so necessary in our lives. Because there are guiding principles. The best way to go at this, instead of reading every book that was written or trying to do that, is ask the simple question, what's in most of the books? What things overlap book after book that are repeated? And how much of it's there? One person asked a question, and he found out that 85% of everything in a leadership books are repeated. So the same stuff's in all of them. And so then, what is the things that we need to look at? Well, there's only five of them if we break them down, because there's only five distinct things in leadership. And we'll look at one of those today. And that's about strategy. Now, we've got some very poor leadership going on in our country for some of our leaders say that bailout is a strategy. And we're teaching our young people that bailout is a responsible leadership strategy. But I beg to differ, because when I think about bailout, I think about getting somebody out of jail, bailing them out of jail. Well, the question is, why did that person get in jail in the first place? Not simply to bail them out. Or maybe if the ship is going down, to think about bailing out a ship. Well, you can bail all you want, but unless you fix the hole in the ship, that's really not going to help the situation, is it? In fact, it's sure to go down because you can't bail out fast enough. Well, bailout's not a leadership strategy, but there are some that truly are that can get us moving. And the first one I want to look at is called strategy. It's called direction and not to have a strategy and direction in our families, our churches, our jobs, is to pay a heavy price, to ignore the idea that we don't need to have some type of a direction in our lives is very costly, and it's something that our Lord doesn't want us to do, to run directionless in our lives. So the first point I want to look at briefly today is that of direction having a direction in our lives. And that will be a turning point for us. Having a direction in our lives will be a turning point. It'll change our families, for if you think your family has to go along the way it is, bumping into things and coming to a grinding halt, where people are alienated from one another, not speaking, always having conflict, arguments, there's a turning point to that, and that can change. Probably our last great leader said something in 1961 in January, and he said, what we're going to do, folks, is we're gonna be the first ones to go to the moon. Our space exploration program is deplorable. So within the next 10 years, we're going to land on the moon. Did anyone believe John Kennedy in 1961, January, that we would end up on the moon? Well, it didn't even take 10 years. For Neil Armstrong did it in July of 1969. We said this is just a small step, but a great one for mankind. Have there been leaders that have done things since then? Or was that it? John Kennedy, maybe, Martin Luther, here I stand. 
Can you think of other great leaders? You can't because they're not in supply. Even though the demand is there, you can pay all you want. You still can't find great leaders because very few of them exist. But for us to be our own leaders then is our turning point because we can't rely on others because you're just not there. So we have to be our own leaders. We have to lead our families. We have to lead our churches and communities and stop the bailouts, whether they become in our own lives or in our community, because that's not leadership. That's giving up. So if we look at leadership, there's five points to it. The first one we'll look at it today is direction, and direction takes us into the future if we decide to, or we'll just sit there if we don't. The disciples were a bunch of leaderless groups because their Lord was taking from them. He was there every day, 24-7. They could rely on him. It would be, where are we going today, Lord? And he would tell them, and they would go there. But it wasn't so anymore because they would wake up in the morning and he wasn't there. He was there, but not when they could rely on him or count on him. So we read this story today about a breakfast at the beach, and it's an interesting story because it's dark. And that's when net fishermen go out and fish. They fish in the dark so the fish don't see the net, and they're out there fishing, and they're catching absolutely nothing. And it's 100 yards off. It's the length of a football field in pitch dark. But Jesus knows they're there, but they can't see Jesus, but he knows they're there. And seven of them are in the boat. And Jesus starts to kid around with them, the way my uncle used to kid around. And he says, kids, hey, kiddies out there. And he's yelling out into the ocean. And he says, you guys didn't catch anything, did you? Well, he's pitch black and it's 100 yards out. How could anybody know that except for Jesus knew that? He says, you didn't catch anything, did you? And so the fisherman's response to that is, well, no. And so Jesus says, you know why? Because you're fishing on the wrong side of the boat. My uncle used to say that all the time. We say, Uncle Larry, did you catch anything? He says, no, nope, must have been fishing on the wrong side of the boat. Same thing he's doing. So Jesus tells, throw the net on the right side of the boat instead of the wrong side. So they throw it on the right side, and what do they catch? A multitude of fish. So much that they can't bring him in. And Peter starts to freak out. Now if you catch the story here, it says Peter's in the boat, and he doesn't have any clothes on. So what does he do? He puts his clothes on and then jumps in the water. I'd probably do it the other way around. Either I jump in the water without my clothes or I put my clothes on and stay in a boat. But Peter puts his clothes on and jumps in the water. So now they're bringing the fish up and they see the Lord and nobody wants to even question who it is because they know they're busted because they're 80 miles away from Jerusalem the last time the Lord saw them. And so now, Jesus is having the conversation with them. And he, well, let's bring the fish in. There's 153. Let's eat some of them. And so they start eating and having a little breakfast celebration. And then Jesus wants to have a little word with Peter. He says, Peter, I've got to ask you a question here. He says, last time we spoke, you were down in Jerusalem. Now you're up here fishing. Do you love me more than these? What these? The fish? The boats? The disciples? The men? The whole thing? What these? Yes, all of it. Are you in this or not, Peter? Are you with me or not? He says, well, sure, Lord, I love you. He says, well, feed my lambs then. But that quite doesn't register. He says, Peter, do you love me more than these? And he says, yeah, Lord, I do. He says, well, feed my sheep. And so he has to ask him one more time, Peter, I need to know, do you love me more than these? I want you to feed my sheep. There's not any sheep on the river or the Sea of Galilee. The sheep are back in Jerusalem. So now he kind of gets what Jesus wants him to do. Do you love me more than these? 
Are these number one in your life? Or am I number one in your life? Because if I'm number one, you just went in the wrong direction. It's back down to Jerusalem, where the real fish are. And that became a turning point for Jesus and Peter and the disciples. Because Peter could have said, hey, Lord, you know what? I've been thinking about it, and I really don't. I'm really not there yet. I need more time. I thought I could do this, but you know what? I don't think it's in me. Have you ever answered the Lord that way? Honestly? Lord, I'm just not ready yet. I don't think I have it in me to follow you. I need some more time. I need some space from you, Jesus. I'm just not there yet. Well, that's two different directions, isn't it? Simon Peter, do you love me more than these? And it's not just Simon Peter he's asking that. He's asking all of his disciples that. Do you love me more than these? Well, what happened is Peter was, the Lord looked in his eyes and he told him what was to come. He told him his future, which could be scaring, but it could be comforting at the same time. Because he showed Peter how he was going to die. Would you want to know that? Would you want to know how you're going to die and when you're going to die? It could be scary, but it could be comforting too. Story of Big Fish by, uh, that was written a while ago. There's a scene in there, some young children. Story in the South, and they heard about this, this woman who lived on the outskirts of town. And these young kids wanted to see her because she was a gypsy or a wish, but she had this magic eye. She had a patch over it. And it was a glass eye, but when you looked in her eye, when she flipped up the patch, you could see how you were going to die. So a bunch of kids went and they knocked on the door. She says, ma'am, we want to see your glass eye. And so she followed them. And two of the kids said, well, did you see it? Did you see it? He says, yeah, well, I brought her here. And so she flips up her eye and one kid looks and he sees his, an old man changing a light bulb and he falls off the ladder and he dies. The other kid looks at her eyes and sees he's a young man who falls down and he dies. And then the third boy didn't look, but then he follows her back and he goes, you know what? I think I need to look at your eye because I think if I know it might make things easier because then I wouldn't be afraid. I wouldn't be afraid the rest of my life until that one day. So would you want to know how you're going to die? Because you don't have to be afraid once you know. And that's what our baptism's about. Because our Lord said, we're already dead. We've already died. There's nothing to be afraid of. It's done. We've died with Christ and raised with him. We will not even experience death. There's nothing to be afraid of. Our future's settled. It's permanent. It's fixed. It's there with Christ. So there's nothing to be afraid of. So then what are we afraid of if there's nothing to be afraid of? Well, they put the chains that St. Peter was captured in and they put it in a church in Italy and it's in a little altar area there. And these are St. Peter's chains and there's a whole church built around these chains. And these are the ones that took St. Peter away before he died. But up until that day, he knew that he could live free. And he didn't have to fear death because he didn't have to do anything until that day because he knew how he was going to die. The Lord gave him that gift. The same way the Lord gives us this gift of baptism. Doesn't matter how we die, we know we're going to be with the Lord. We know what our future is. 
it's fixed. So we can live a fearless and carefree, faith-filled life. So Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Like I say, well, Pastor Ken, I'm just trying to get through the day. I'm just trying to raise my family and get through putting food on the table. Well, we still can be leaders with that too because we can find some clarity in what the Word of God is giving to us in our families. We can be parents. We can be grandparents. We can be aunts and uncles, and we still need to know what we can give our children, even if we're teachers. We can give them some things that the Lord has taught us. Keys to being effective parents. How do you know when you've done your job as a parent? Well, your kids are going to be independent and responsible. If they're independent and responsible at 13 or 14, you've done your job as a parent. And if they're 25 and 30 and they're still not independent and responsible, you still haven't done your job. Because that's the goal of parenting. Get our kids to be independent and responsible and that's the goal that's the direction that's the strategy for being a parent or even a grandparent or an aunt or an uncle to raise independent and responsible kids otherwise you'll do what I've done you call the teens up when they have alarm clocks you pick up their clothes you're always searching for misplaced things double checking their homework always giving money beyond allowance I've done everything wrong you can do for parenting at least four times. So I can tell you, allowing to disrespect curfews, providing constant chauffeur services, taking responsibility for their household duties. I know you wouldn't do those kind of things because you know better, but I didn't. Luckily, my wife knew better. So if you have one parent who knows what's going on, the kids have half a chance. And luckily, my wife could raise them because I kept making the mistakes over and over and over again. But that's me. You can be a permissive parent, which is really a non-parent, because you're not there, you're absent. Why do you do it? Well, you want to feel needed, don't you? Oh, honey, I just want you to know that I care about you. I'll just do your laundry and take care of you, and I want you to know that I love you. Right? Do you, do you fake that one? Because you want to feel needed. So you rob your kids of their independence and their responsibility because we want to feel needed. Did you ever go down that road? Well, what it does is, is it creates disrespect, it creates anger, rebellion, revenge, all of that stuff. Contempt. It doesn't give them self-respect and independence and mutual respect. It does the opposite we think we can do by wanting to be needed. But if we want to do character building, parenting, we can produce respect and independence, and you create caring children, concerned children, children who are independent and respectful of themselves and others when you take that direction and quit being permissive it absent. Get rid of that I want to be loved thing. Well, after a while I found out it wasn't my kids who needed to change, it was me. I don't know if that works with you or not, but when the parents change, the kids seem to do a lot better than the other way around. Jesus said, do you love me more than these? Well, feed my sheep, lead them to green pastures, and get back down to Jerusalem and follow me, Peter. The fishing days are done. It's being a pastor now, tending after the sheep. Are you willing to do that? Because then you will be a leader. You'll be leading my people into the paths that they need to go. You have commitment then, that's the turning point. When you commit to this, and you seize the moment, and your life begins to change. When you commit to that direction of following 
the leader. We're invited to follow Jesus because he's given us such a great way to do that. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We receive our tithes and offerings.